Hi everyone, this lesson is on the condition known as retinitis pigmentosa. So we're going to talk about the causes of this condition. We're also going to talk about some of the pathophysiology behind why this occurs. We're also going to talk about some of the signs and symptoms, how it's diagnosed and how it's treated. So retinitis pigmentosa is also known as hereditary retinal dystrophy. It is actually not just one condition, but it is actually a group of hereditary eye conditions involving degeneration of photoreceptors within the retina. The photoreceptors are going to be the rods and the cones. Now the rods are involved in vision in low light or dim conditions. So you can think of night vision and cones are responsible for vision involving higher or brighter lights. So cones can help distinguish colors, whereas rods are not great at distinguishing colors, but they're better at night vision. So we can remember that because that's going to be important when we talk about some of the signs and symptoms that occur in this condition. Now, it's important to make note that the degeneration of the photoreceptors is more likely to affect rods more than cones. So rods will degenerate more than cones. So this is going to affect night vision more often in these individuals and at earlier stages in the condition. We're going to talk more about this later on in this lesson. And what often happens is the degeneration of the photoreceptors, which are responsible for vision, they will slowly and progressively worsen over time, leading to progressive vision loss. And as we mentioned before, this condition is actually a group of hereditary eye conditions. So it is due to gene mutations. Now, most cases are actually autosomal recessive in nature. So you need two copies of an affected allele, which is a version of a gene. You need two copies in order to have this condition. So most cases are going to be autosomal recessive. So if we take a look at this diagram here, both parents are carriers and then one quarter of their children. So one in four children will be affected because one in four will have both copies of the affected allele. And then that affected child will have retinitis pigmentosa. So autosomal recessive in most cases, approximately 60 to 70% of cases will be autosomal recessive. But then there's some other modes of transmission, including autosomal dominant, which only requires one affected allele. And then there's X-linked, which is going to more likely to occur in male patients as they only have one X chromosome. Now, retinitis pigmentosa is estimated to occur in approximately 1 in 5,000 people. And carriers for affected alleles is estimated to be 1 in 100 people. And retinitis pigmentosa is actually the most commonly inherited retinal disease. And the onset of signs and symptoms occurs in different age groups depending on the underlying genetic cause. If it is an autosomal recessive cause, then the onset is more often going to occur in teenage years. If it is an autosomal dominant case, it's more likely to occur in the patient's 20s. Now let's talk about the pathophysiology of this condition. So the whole background as to why retinitis pigmentosa occurs is due to genetic mutations. So retinal cells may contain a variety of mutations. And again, this depends on the underlying genetic cause. So it could be autosomal recessive in some cases, which again would, would require two affected alleles, but it could be autosomal dominant, which would only require one affected allele. So nonetheless, there's going to be mutations in those retinal cells, those photoreceptor cells, the rods and cones. What happens is that the mutations in those cells trigger apoptosis or programmed cell death. So the mutations in those retinal photoreceptors, the rods and cones, causes those rods and cones to undergo apoptosis, programmed cell death. So those rods and cones will die. And then that apoptosis can then trigger apoptosis in surrounding cells. So if there is programmed cell death of a rod cell, it can lead to programmed cell death of cones or other rods that surround it. And then with that apoptosis, retinal pigment epithelial cells then detach and deposit into perivascular areas, leading to what we call bony spicule shaped melanin deposits. So these bony spicule shaped deposits of melanin start to deposit in perivascular areas. And this is going to help us with the diagnosis later. So I wanted to mention that here. And I also want to make note of the fact that this condition is called retinitis pigmentosa, retinitis, itis meaning inflammation. There is actually minimal inflammation going on in the retina. It's more of this programmed cell death of retinal photoreceptors that's going on with regards to the pathophysiology, which is ultimately due to mutations in those retinal photoreceptor cells. So I just want to make mention of that here. Now let's talk about the signs and symptoms of this condition. So it's important to make note that symptom onset occurs early on in life. We talked about some of the onset that can occur in teenage years in the autosomal recessive cases, but some minor findings can be noticed even earlier than that. So oftentimes the clinically significant 
findings are going to present a little later, but there can be some signs and symptoms that can occur even earlier than that. So one of them is going to be a very subtle but decreased night vision. So this can become very subtle, but it can be progressive as a patient gets older and as rod cells continue to degenerate and undergo apoptosis, they can lose their night vision capabilities. So they can have decreasing night vision as they get older, as the condition worsens. And ultimately, it can lead to a total loss of night vision, which we would refer to as night blindness. And this is actually going to be the early symptom. For whatever reason, rod cells are oftentimes going to be the first cells that undergo apoptosis. Now, this condition can also lead to reduced vision. As the rod cells begin to diminish in number, the cone cells can also start to diminish as well, and this can lead to reduced vision for individuals. What often happens is the peripheral vision, the vision on the sides of the visual field, are lost first. So this can lead to tunnel vision. And then as the condition advances and worsens, central vision begins to be affected as well. So it starts in the periphery, and it slowly closes in on the patient. So it's important to always assess the peripheral vision of patients. They may not notice that their peripheral vision is starting to be reduced, but it is. So it can be some subtle changes that can eventually progress and worsen where they lose their peripheral vision entirely and then start to lose their central vision as well. And then the central vision is going to be when the macula is affected. Now, this condition can also lead to flashes of light, which we would refer to as photopsia. So flashes of light can occur. The retina is a light sensitive layer of neurosensory cells. So as the retina slowly degrades and degenerates, it can lead to a sensation of flashes of light, which we would refer to as photopsia. And these three findings, decreased night vision, reduced vision in general, and flashes of light or photopsia are the three hallmark symptoms of retinitis pigmentosa. So it's important to make note of these three symptoms. Now, there are some other clinical findings, which include glaring. So glare from different objects can occur as well. And this is more likely to be caused by posterior subcapsular cataracts. If you want more information on these types of cataracts, please check out my full lesson on cataracts. And then there can be some issues with difficulty adjusting from darkness to light environments. So because there is changes in light sensitivity, especially with reduced night vision, reduced vision in dimly lit environments, there can be some difficulty adjusting from different environments that have different levels of lighting. So this can often lead to difficulty driving, and this can often be due to nyctalopia, so that decreased night vision we talked about before. How do clinicians diagnose and treat this condition? So oftentimes it's going to be diagnosed by ophthalmological examination. So fundoscopy findings, looking at the fundus, so looking at the retina, looking at the macula, it's going to be important. So there's oftentimes three important fundoscopic findings. These include arteriolar narrowing. So looking at the arteries in the retina, if there is narrowing, that is one finding. Bony spicule pigmentation is another one. So looking here, we can see some of those bony spicules. And then optic disc pallor. So the optic disc appears more pale than it should. So those are three important findings with regards to making the diagnosis of this condition. There's some other findings that can also be important to make note of, and these include subscapular cataracts. We talked about subscapular cataracts as a cause of glaring in this condition. And then macular edema, so the macula becomes edematous as well, so that can also be a finding. It's also important to make note of family history. If it is autosomal recessive in nature, it may only be found in distant relatives or may not be found at all, but if it is autosomal dominant, then one of the parents is going to have this condition. And it's also important to assess siblings to see if they also have this condition as well. And then it's also important to assess for other causes of some of these symptoms. So certain infections can lead to some of these findings as well. So it's important to rule out other causes. So after diagnosis, how do clinicians treat this condition? Because this is a hereditary condition, there is no treatment. It is going to be supportive. There can be some supplementation with vitamins A and E, which may reduce the progression in some cases, although some evidence suggests that this may not be the case. So this may be one possible way of reducing the progression in some cases. And then the prognosis is going to depend on the underlying genetic cause. If it is X-linked, if it is on the X chromosome, it's actually very poor. The prognosis is going to be very poor. 
And it's actually a better prognosis in the autosomal dominant inherited retinitis pigmentosa. If you want more information on ophthalmological conditions, please check out my ophthalmology playlist. And if you haven't already, please like and subscribe for more lessons like this one. Thanks so much for watching and hope to see you next time.